Okay, so our next speaker is going to talk to it's Joe Harrison from Washington State University. He's going to talk to us about struvite recovery. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Joe. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Try that again. Good morning. <laughs> okay. So on the same theme of phosphorus, uh, I'll be visiting with you about a, a project that uh, has been funded by the uh, NRCS Conservation Innovation uh, Innovation Grant Funds. Um, and also sponsored by uh, our dairy industry as well. Um, at 11.50 this morning, I'll actually talk about uh, the system which uh, and some of the aspects of that that actually produces this uh, struvite material. So <clears throat> if you're interested in learning more about how we actually produce this material, it'll be later uh, this morning. So it's called the Mobile Struvite Project. We actually developed a system. It's on a trailer. It's on about a 24-foot trailer and we can move it from uh, farm to farm. And so the partners on this was Multiform Harvest. Um, Keith Bowers did his PhD program at NC State back in the days where they had the Manure Center, the National Manure Center, and developed uh, <clears throat> the system to uh, extract phosphorus out of uh, swine manure. And so Keith was gonna be moving to the Northwest, and so I told him to get a hold of me. Uh, once he arrived in Seattle, so we've been working for the last uh, 12, uh, 15 years adapting that system he originally developed for swine to use it on dairy. As I mentioned, it's a CIG uh, sponsored grant and uh, we also had the Dairy Farmers of Washington that were also involved in providing funding. Um, so a little background, uh, the issue at hand with uh, regard to phosphorus, the cows use about 13% of it for maintenance. About 27%, or a little less than a third, is going to go into the milk carton. So you're obviously left with about 60% in the manure. So, um, and then with our manure storage systems in the Northwest, we're volatilizing a lot of that nitrogen out of the lagoons. So again, you get this imbalance between nitrogen and phosphorus. So if you're looking at a, uh, a nitrogen-based manure application, you're obviously beginning to build up phosphorus over time. So uh, in 2002, I did some calculations. Uh, I had uh, availability of information from um, Conservation District who had written nutrient management plans for all the dairies in Whatcom County. And um, as uh, Re Rebecca did, did some uh, back of the envelope calculations in terms of what the county might look like from a phosphorus balance standpoint. And so at that time, uh, based on some, I think, solid assumptions, there was about 2,362 tons of phosphorus eaten by the cows. Uh, we had about 637 tons of phosphorus exported in milk. Manure applied to about 44,000 acres, and that left uh, about 1,724 tons of, uh, of phosphorus balance. So in that county alone, which is the northwesternmost county right up next to Canada, they were going to need another 44,000 acres to meet their to, to approach a phosphorus balance. So, obviously, a, a big challenge. So it was you know around this time that I thought, well, I've worked the first half of my career on the front end of the cow and pushed lots of feed in. I'm out to try to do something on the other end to try to help out. So Keith and I began to work together on that. So the county I referred to is right up here, um, but we have a lot of. Uh, alfalfa that's grown in eastern Washington and has moved to western Washington for our dairy production and uh, but we don't really have a system regionally where we've got phosphorus going back and so this project's really talking about um, trying to reconnect this broken nutrient cycle that we've had for decades uh, either regionally or nationally or globally uh, where we're trying to get the nutrients back to where um, they came from. So the material that um, we'll be talking about today is, is so pure struvite would have an NPK um, and magnesium formula, fertilizer formula 629.0 plus 10. Um, it would be considered kind of a slow or medium release rate for phosphorus. Uh, the water solubility is good, uh, but it's not uh, necessarily prone to leaching. So you've got kind of a, you know, maybe a release rate that may more match up with uh, needs by the crop. So the form the uh, struvite, um, we need to break this calcium and phosphorus, and that was one of the big challenges with dairy manure versus swine, was that we, we see a lot more calcium in the, in the feces of cows than we do in, uh, in swine. So we needed to acidify the liquid manure, 
uh, after the large particle solids are, are removed. So we can have uh, calcium off by itself and free phosphorus that then can form. So you take am ammonia, magnesium, and this free phosphorus, you raise the pH, and you'll create a, a crystalline um, material, which um, I say looks much like sand. So this is a quarter, give you an idea. So this is a material that was uh, produced a number of years ago. <coughs> so um, pretty user friendly, uh, easy to transport, and obviously you're not uh, hauling a lot of water down the road. So the technology itself, again, we're making struvite. Here's the chemical formula for it. It's a crystallization process. Um, the, the, uh, and I'll show you a, a picture of the cone here in a minute, but the particular fluidized bed cone we are using is a 32,000 liter. Um, so what we do is lower the pH. Currently been doing that with sulfuric or in a talk I'll give later this morning, we've actually used oxalic acid as well. And then we beat, uh, boost the pH with either ammonia or caustic soda. Currently we're using ammonia water. And um, then the magnesium, boost that with typically mag chloride, but you can also do it with mag ox uh, plus carbon dioxide. So this is a cartoon schematic. So obviously collecting the manure from the cow, you want to get the large particle solids pulled out because that's, um, you want to keep that from going up through the, the fluidized bed cone. Take the liquid manure, we put it into uh, about a 4,000 gallon tank and do some pretreatment on that for uh, lowering the pH, adding in the mag chloride, and then that material is transferred and pumped, uh, pumped into the cone. So once it's pumped into the bottom of the cone, current flow rates, we've been running this somewhere between, on this particular system, about five to eight gallons a minute. So you want enough upflow that it keeps this bed fluidized or swirling but you don't want it so fast that what you're doing is actually pushing material over the top. Um, so after you've uh, developed bed, then you just drain it, air dry it, and then put on a truck and haul it to Eastern Washington. One of the concepts I've used is we've got trucks coming west, um, hauling hay at 30 tons a, a, a load. And so why not do some bulker bags or super sacks and be hauling some struvite back to the alfalfa fields to the Eastern Washington. This is an actual cone. Um, this is about 20 foot in height, um, so you know, small diameter at the bottom and then expands and then at the top it, it kind of flares out quite a bit more. Um, so we looked at uh, manure from 30 dairies over the last 18 months um, and the factors that really uh, predominated how well it performed were percent suspended solids, uh, the calcium content obviously, iron can have a, a negative impact. And then the ratio, obviously, of orthophosphate to total P. The more ortho P is there, the more we can, we can harvest. And then also we found out we had some manure that was low in ammonia concentration in one of our eastern Washington locations, and that tended to have an effect on, on production as well. Um, we looked at the reduction of ortho and total P in samples from the cone compared to them coming in. In 17 runs, we had... Um, 37% um, on average with a range of 1 to 88% reduction. And in 17 uh, runs with a total P reduction was positive. Again, we had a range of 1.5 to 86 with an average of 29. These higher uh, reduction rates were on manure that was anaerobically digested because you're moving more of that organic P into an inorganic form. And it needs to be in that inorganic form to be able to be uh, formed into struvite. Uh, we also... Um, so this was actually the analysis we did. Again, this would be a pure struvite, 629O. Um, so this was the, the uh, on average, from 25 different struvite samples. So we're getting a, a product that, that um, fairly represents a, a fairly pure material. Uh, we also looked at citrate-soluble phosphoric acid uh, as a way of getting some kind of a field uh, best guess of uh, availability of phosphorus for, uh, for plant availability the test at least is used in the West. And from 18 samples, we saw a, a, a citrate soluble P of about 25. Okay, so now to the agronomic part. So we had um, a, a part of this project was not only produce the struvite, but then try to get a users. And in our alfalfa industry, I thought this piece would be slow. They might be hesitant to adopt it, and they have not at all. They're very anxious to use the material. And so we had two commercial growers that were willing to let us, uh, in one case, a new seeding, and in another <coughs> case, an established stand of alfalfa. So a little bit of the background. Um, 
So based on soil tests, uh, Olson P, we uh, needed to apply about 64 pounds of P for the, the field that had the new seeding. So uh, using monomonium phosphate on that one, we had 123 pounds per acre. And then with the struvite, we needed about uh, 220, uh, 21 pounds of, of uh, material to be applied. On the established stand, uh, we needed about 30 and 75. There was a little bit of difference in the side of the field. Uh, just one of those things you deal with when doing field work. And again, then we either applied, um, in this case, a little bit of combination of, of um, uh, MAP and struvite, or we applied just struvite. So, because that was one of our other interests, is there, is there actually a, a ratio of, those, of these that might work best? Uh, this is Olson soil P tests. Um, we want a ad adequate range would be up in here. Um, these fields typically um, were closer to about 10 to 12 when we started, but there was, um, uh, so this was the new seeding field, applied the, the struvite and the monomonium phosphate, and the level stayed relatively good up here until early 2018, started getting a couple harvests. Then you see the dip. We had another application in the fall of 2018, and we see the, the soil test coming up um, rather readily. So we are seeing um, a good response in the soil tests. Uh, this was the established stand. Um, and again, we started here, um, applied the uh, materials, got the, essentially the same levels from an Olson P standpoint. <coughs> And then uh, these are the reductions over time where the control was slightly higher than um, the struvite in this case. And then there was a, after we had taken these soil test samples, uh, there was another uh, uh, application. So we'll be, we actually take, we took uh, some 8 inch samples of the alfalfa this last week and we're into the 2019 production season on this same, same study. Okay, so looking at uh, the yields, this was the established stand. Uh, yields were about, this, so this was a four cutting scheme on this particular farm. So seven and a half tons versus 7.14, so maybe a slight numerical advantage to struvite. The percent phosphorus in the material itself, 0 0.32, 0 0.31. And then the phosphorus uptake per acre was right at about 38, 39 pounds uh, per acre. So on the new seeding, um, we had uh, we were able to get yield data on two of three cuttings. Unfortunately, the producer didn't grab bale counts and, and bale weights on the, the one cutting. But so of two of three, we were at about a, a, a 2.9 and a 3.1 uh, yield. So very similar in yields. Phosphorus levels very similar to the other uh, location, but right around 0 0.28, 0 0.27. And then because of fewer cuts, um, P uptake at about 16 and 15. So um, seemingly getting pretty good performance. The, the uh, producers are real happy with the product. So in terms of looking at the actual forage quality, uh, this would be uh, across the whole season rather than by cutting. But um, the tissue content uh, for the phosphorus for the whole season was right around 0.28 for the new seeding and 0.27 for the established stand. If we looked at just that first cutting, which will occur in May in our area, uh, the values were 0 0.24, 0 0.25, and about 0 0.26, 0 0.27. So still fairly uh, similar levels of phosphorus content. And we also had more detailed analysis, protein, NDF, ADF, and those sorts of things, but I just used average uh, relative feed value here to give you an idea of quality. Uh, fairly similar, but a little divergence here. We actually saw in some of our field, um, actually our, our, our uh, replicated plot studies at one of our experiment stations in the eastern Washington that there may be uh, a situation that occurs with these that if you harvest at the same date, that the, the struvite forage may have actually advanced the maturity a little quicker than the map. And so on those plot studies, we actually have some uh, maturity rating data that we didn't have with the um, alfalfa growers. So um, I don't think this is necessarily um, saying that it had a higher feed value here had you harvested at the exact same stage of maturity, I think these RFEs would have been very similar. Here with, uh, we kind of have a, a, an established stand, a little bit of the reverse, where this one actually showed um, a little higher RFV. But basically, from a practical standpoint, we're getting really similar uh, production. So that's, that's good for the industry. Um, so with that, uh, questions, um, we do have some short videos that talk about the application of the material, working with these growers. And we also have, um, 
videos of the actual system running and producing the struvite. So, Rob. Uh, really cool stuff, Joe, with the system. Are you working on how payments are going to work? Is the guy producing the struvite getting anything, or is the... Yeah, so lots of different business models out there that could play out. Um, and um, we've had one dairy uh, in Maryland that adopted the system a few years ago, Jones Dairy, 2,000 cow operation. And um, there what they did was they uh, sold the equipment at a price which would allow, uh, you know, the company that produced it uh, a way of making some money off of it. And then the, uh, the cost for running a system and any product that came out of it and the marketing of that was then on the dairy. Um, so that's, that's one potential model. The other one would be that you would have a company that might develop a, a mobile system that might go farm to farm, because not every farm would need to run this 365 days of the year or even 100 days of the year. You know, your, your, your phosphorus balance solution is different for every single farm. And so uh, I think a mobile system, while we did it for demonstration purposes, I think as a business model, it, it could play out that it would work that way. Um, the other the other way is to sell the equipment really inexpensively, and then uh, a company would take uh, ownership of the phosphorus and then market that. So I, I think as this matures uh, in the in the in the industry, I think we'll see some of those different models play out. So um, that's that's the reality of where it is at this point. So, yep. How well does that material spread in a spinner spreader tape? It works pretty well. Um, this can also, we didn't apply any of it this way, but they've also, the companies have worked on prilling it. So you can come up with a beadlet, with it, which then you could mix with other uh, nutrients and, and create, you know, specialty applications. There was also a um, company on the West that was interested in combining it with lime and be able to get lime out at the same time to deal with some, uh, trying to get pHs up on some of our acidic soils. So, uh, but it's, it's pretty user friendly. So, other questions? Yeah, Rick? Back to the business model, do you think it's going to be a competitive price-wise product with a MAP or a DAP or something like that? Well, it has to be, or otherwise it's not going to be. Right, but well, I mean, are, do you have, have you been able to go that far to say it, it should be? Or? Yeah, and I think one of the things that we're, we're kind of focusing on now, one piece is trying to make this organic because organic folks are really got some issues trying to get a hold of organic pee, just pee. And um, so part of our effort, like with the ammonia water we're using versus using sodium hydroxide or caustic soda, we could we can get material that would be um, uh, certified organic on that side. The one we're struggling a little bit with is the, the acid side of things right now. You know, how do you get an acid that would be considered organic? And then all of a sudden you've got a, a product that's high value. Um, the other one is that this material works quite well in, um, uh, for the potting industry. Um, <coughs> and pot is legal in Washington, so it's not pot, but it's potted plants. So the horticulture industry. <laughs> so, um, and there again, you're going to be able to have high dollar <coughs> product and get a pretty good sales. So I, I think there's a lot of various market opportunities there. I don't know. It may be good for marijuana plants too. I don't know, but <laughs> get a, Federally funded project can't do that with federal money. Yeah. If you need to scale up to for a dairy for a, not a mobile system but the whole dairy system, you put more cones or you make a bigger cone? Well, again, each farm would would depend. So you know, if if you need to get rid of 10% of your phosphorus, you might go with a mobile system. And but if you wanted to, if you got a lot of phosphorus to get rid of, then you probably want to scale it up on your farm. And I think that, you know, do you want to run it all year long? You're in southern Idaho. Do you want to run it in the winter? Maybe not. So maybe you scale it up so that you're, and then you have to have liquid material available. So um, in the summer, you may, may maybe not have much. So you may be working on the shoulders of the seasons where you're working with the material in the fall and the spring, but avoiding it when everything's frozen in the winter and just not the hassles of that. So lots of different ways of scaling it. Right. Yes. I think we're out of time for questions. Sorry. So okay. thank you, Joe. All right. Appreciate it.